looking through for each region that is selected, in other words, each region that's in our region map, the map of regions that we have chosen to select, we go and we pull all of those file names, all those images, image names, and put them into a list, an array. That's this file name list. And we get rid of the .png. We then go through and we create this quiz country list, which goes in and pulls 10 flags out of that list of available flags. So if we picked North America and South America, our um, one array, the file name list, would contain all of the flags for North and South America. Our quiz country list then would contain 10 of those flags. And it would make sure that we didn't pick the same flag twice. All right? So we randomly generate a number. We look to see if it's already in the list. And if it's not already in the list, we add it. Then we add the next flag. All right? Or, or I'm sorry, then we load the next flag. And that has the effect of starting the quiz. I don't actually like the way this part is coded. Um, there's a few instances of what I consider to be sloppy code in, in this example, but I think the bigger concepts are, are handled fairly well. What this does is this goes and it looks, and it loops through. All right. It pulls off the top item from the quiz list. All right the quiz country list, so and sets the next image name variable to that. So essentially what we're doing is we have that array of the 10 flags we're going to choose. We grab the top element off the list and take it off the list. So every, everyone gets bumped up one. So now we have nine left and so on. All right. We know that that option is the correct answer. We know the name of the image is the correct answer. Here we're displaying the number of questions. Here we're getting rid of the region from the image's file name. If you notice, each one of these file names consists of the region name, a dash, and a .png. We stripped off the .png before, now we're stripping off the region name. We then, and we actually go and get the image from the appropriate file, or I'm sorry, from the appropriate asset folder, and we set the flag view to that flag image that we pulled. So let's review this. If we remember these images, these images are each in a folder called the name of the region. If we then notice each image name starts with the name of the region. That's important, right? Because in our list of questions that we're going to ask, in that list of 10 questions, we can have multiple regions, right? So we need to know where to go get the image from. We might have, for example, to name two images, we may have North America, Canada, and we may have Africa, Egypt, all right? That's the image names that are in there. When we actually physically pull that image, image name out, we need to know the region plus the image name because each image is, is, is in its own folder that corresponds to the region. All right. All we have in that array is the image name. So what do we do? We pluck out the region. And we use that as the folder 
that we tack on in front of the image name and then add a .png on. And then we create a drawable view for that flag using this file. Then we set the flag image view to that image. What's the flag image view? If we go back to the layout, that is this guy right here in our main XML, which is the main image of the flag. If we give any kind of error, we again, we catch that exception and we do something with it. Typically we put exception trapping around our code that we consider the riskiest, the most vulnerable to fail. All right? If we're just adding a couple numbers together, you know, there's really no chance that that's going to fail necessarily. So exception code is less, less important there. If, however, in this case, we're running out and we're doing some disk I.O., all right, there's a chance that something could go wrong. For example, I could have accidentally put a flag in the wrong region. All right? If I put Egypt, for example, in the Europe folder, all right, it would look for the Egyptian image in the Africa folder, wouldn't find it, and it would give me an exception. Likewise, this scheme depends on the first part of the image name to be the region. So if I don't get that right, if I misspell Africa for one of the images, or misspell Europe, or whatever, it's not going to be able to find it, because it's going to look for the folder uh, spelled incorrectly. So file I.O. is just one of those inherent, uh, inherently uh, risky operations. So that's why you notice any place where we're doing that sort of file I.O. is where we're doing the exception trapping. The rest of the stuff, well, we, you know, what can go wrong with that? We then go in and we clear out our answer area. All right. So we get rid of any buttons that were there previously. We don't care how many buttons were there. We're going to get rid of all of them. All right. We're going to get rid of each row's worth of buttons in that button table layout. What's the button table layout? That's where the buttons for the answers live. So there might be one row in it if, the, if we've chosen that there's three options. There might be two rows in it if we've chosen six options. Or there might be three rows in it if we've chosen nine. In any case, we're getting rid of that. Getting rid of, we're clearing out everything in there. We're then going to shuffle our file list. And we're going to remove from the file list the correct answer. But we're doing it at the end of the list. All right. The reason for this code is we need to know exactly where our correct answer is. All right. So these lines of code, to pull it out of wherever it is after we've shuffled it and put it at the end of the list guarantees that we know where the correct answer is. Let's say, for example, we have in our file name list 
you know, ten, uh, you know, ten countries, or, or yeah, well, let's say twenty countries, and we've randomly selected Canada. Now, Canada might be in the fifth position, let's say. Now, when we go to display the options, all right, we better make sure that Canada is the one is one of them that gets chosen, right? Because otherwise, you know, we'll give them three choices, let's say, and if Canada isn't one of them, then they can't possibly get the question correct. So by this little mechanism, we shuffle up all the, all the possible answers. We then put the correct answer at the end of the list so we know where it is. We're then going to go through, and... Here's where we're going to use the number of rows that we have set through our options. We initialize it at three, but we can change that through our options. Here's where we go through and we loop through and create the number of correct answer rows. And as we're adding each button, We're setting the on-click listener. Here we have a loop inside a loop. The loop here goes in and adds a new row to the list of options, or list of possible answers. We then go in and we inflate each button. So we inflate the three buttons, grabbing a random value for that, and creating a button that contains the name of the, the country. And by the way, we're selecting uh, for that button and setting the on-click listener. So the outer loop adds each individual row. The inner loop adds to each row the three buttons that we want. And as we add it, we set the on-click listener. We then add the new button to our new table row, which adds it to the table. Now, here is where, at this point, we've just picked three answers, or six answers, or nine answers. We haven't guaranteed that the correct answer is one of them, right? Here's where we go in and we grab at random, one of the buttons, one of the rows, one of the buttons, and replace the button with the correct answer. So this little snippet of code here makes sure that one of the options that was chosen is in fact the correct answer. And it's not always in the same position, right? Because it randomly picks a number of row that it should be in, and within that row, it randomly picks the button. And we then go and we set for that button the country name. Throughout this, there's a get country name method used. And essentially what that does is that strips out the region from the front of it. All right. We stripped it out before to find the folder. Now we're eliminating it from the file name because you know, we want to display the optional answers as Egypt or Uganda or whatever, not Africa-Egypt. All right. Set on, click listener, guest button listener. Remember when we created each of those buttons, we created the guest button listener. And really all that does is calls our submit guest method and passes the button that was clicked. All right? Again, the on click, notice that this, I guess, an argument of view. 
The view that it gets past is what was actually clicked. You can click a bunch of different things, right? All views, all listeners have an on-click method that gives, that, that gets past the view that was actually clicked on. We know, however, that the view that got clicked on in this case was a button. So we're going to pass that to our submit guess. Now here again is a recurring theme. Notice how there's almost no code in this listener. All right? There's not a bunch of code in the listener. This code simply calls another method, and the other method does the job. All the listener does is sort of the, the traffic cop, if you will. All right? This button got clicked. All right, you go and do your job. And that's pretty consistent, and that's just in general good programming practice. I mean, I'd be saying the same thing if we were teaching a C-sharp class or a Java class or whatever. All right? You don't typically have a lot of code in your listener uh, events. The listener event simply delegated to someone else some other method to process. So the submit guess method. Submit guess. This is what gets called when a guess is made. Again, it gets past the button. We grab the answer. That the user has made. From the text of the button. If remember. In this example. Each of these buttons has, as its text, the name of the country. So we grab that text from the button that we got passed. We grab the correct answer, and we go and we compare. Does the guess equal the correct answer? If it does, then we're correct. If we have reached 10 correct answers, in other words, it's going to only give you 10 flags no matter what, because if you don't get a correct answer, it's just going to ask you over and over again until you do get it correct. All right? If it is your 10th question, it's going to go and it's going to tell you how many guesses you had and, and what your percentage is and so on, and it's going to display an alert saying the results. Otherwise, it does a little delay. It gives you a chance to see, hey, you didn't get it correct before it moves on. If it's not correct, then that's where we go and we set the animation. And and make the flag shake or turn or whatever it is that we wanted to do with that. I know there's a lot of stuff in this. All right. And I know that, you know, Studying this is more, you know, is, is more important than simply learning how this application works. What you want to do is you want to take the parts of this application that can be applied to other applications and, and understand um, those things, in addition to understanding how this works. Here's the important things in my mind about this application, All right, the things that you should focus on and make sure you understand how, how, how they work. All right. Number one, make sure you understand how the animation works. All right. There's a number of different ways you can do animations, but this is one of them, where you specify an XML file that has a list of steps and timing associated with those steps that you can execute and you can cause a lot of things to happen. You define that XML file and then you can apply that animation to any number of different views. So how the animation works, that's one thing. The second thing I would make sure that you know and, and understand is how the options work. 
all right? There's options in this example for both the number of choices that you have and the number of regions that are going to be included in the quiz. So understand how that works. In other words, understand how we pop up that first menu of options. Once we've made a selection of which option we want to change then, how we pop up an alert box to uh, allow the user to, to choose their options and then continue. Those, I would say, are the two most important things here. Sort of the gyrations it goes through to generate the quiz and, and verify that you have a correct answer and so on, those are important and, and review that to um, refresh your uh, ability to understand Java syntax. But I would say the big transferable pieces from this um, are the two things that I mentioned. The other thing that I would say is relevant is the section where it's creating the buttons. All right. It's inflating this XML file for the guess. And it's doing that a certain number of times. It does that by looking to see how many rows are to be generated, generating a new row, and then going in and adding each of the three buttons to that row. The other thing that happens is that, that is especially relevant is as we add a button, we set the on click listener. That on click listener, again, its on click event gets passed an argument. This is what allows us to know exactly what got clicked, right? We don't know what got clicked because it could be any one of the nine, potentially nine buttons. Each of the potentially nine buttons have the same on-click listener. But we somehow have to know which button got clicked. We have to know what their answer is. How do we know that? Well, that on-click listener's on-click event gets passed a view, which in this case we know the view's a button because that's all it's the only views that we're using in this particular part of the application. So that view V is the argument that gets passed to the on click event that says, hey, this is a specific view that got clicked. We then can go and evaluate whether that's the correct option or not by calling our submit guess function. Again, the other thing that I would say uh, to, to focus on and to note is that there's not a lot of code in the event handler. The code simply calls a, a method and the method goes and does that. That makes it easier to um, change the way the interface works. Remember, you're always going to have your interface code, you're going to have your processing code, and you're going to have a glue that sort of glues the two together. That's effectively what this function is, is it's the glue. It simply says, hey, when you click this button, uh, run off and do those things. We're always going to need to grade this question, right? We might change the way the interface works. We might change it instead of being buttons like this will be like radio buttons, for example, or some other kind of structure. We might change the way that the interface for this works. 
by keeping the code out of the event, that gives us a lot more flexibility as we go in and alter it and maybe change the interface. Now again, I could see changing this code. One thing I might change about this code is I might not have the submit guest take a button as an argument. Really, the correct answer isn't a button. The correct answer is the country, or the answer that they've chosen is the country that's associated with the button. Therefore, I might change this code instead of passing a button to pass the string of the answer. What advantage would that offer? If I change this interface to have a text box where the user typed in the answer, then I wouldn't have to change much about my processing code because it would be expecting the function that, that would grade the quiz would be expecting a string. All right? Whereas now it's expecting a button. So if I were to change the interface, if the interface changed and I wasn't clicking buttons to give the correct answer, then I'd have to go and change the submit guess method, which I shouldn't have to do really. All right? I shouldn't have to change my processing code to change the user interface. All right? The user interface should provide to my processing code what it really needs. And in this case, it doesn't really need a button. It really needs um, a string of, of what uh, the answer that they selected in. That would then, then lend itself to any sort of user interface because no matter what, there's going to be a way for the user to select a country, whether they type it in, press a button, click a radio button, or whatever. Choose from a drop down. All right? That would just make the code a lot more flexible. Any questions about this? Again, I realize this is a lot. Um, my aim isn't to. Um, how do I want to put this? I think it's important for you to take kind of the discussion that I have and go back and look at the code again. All right? Because it's very difficult to understand this code in one pass. You know, some of the things I see have me scratching my head, you know, as I look at it. So I don't necessarily under, uh, expect you to understand every aspect of it at a glance. All right? But my hope is, is through what's covered in the book and what's covered in the lectures, um, that gives you sort of a preview and gives you some background so you can go and explore these, these uh, functions and, and code on your own. And in addition, I hope to point out the things that are going to be transferred from application to application. All right. Wednesday will be a work day, so bring your materials, your laptops, or whatever. I do have Android devices if you need, need them. All right. But um, in... in uh, Android is supposed to be installed in the lab, but it probably would be better if you have your own laptop, then you won't have to wrestle with any sort of configuration issues. All right, we'll see you over in lab.